Hello and welcome to the Knit Dispatch. I am your host, John Sauber from the Center Daily Times, joined as always by Audrey Snyder of The Athletic. Audrey, uh, it was a long night of Penn State football. Uh, it sounds I like you had a rough lose. night, John. It sounds like Listen, you're running off your hours of sleep. Yeah, we've got we've got the morning voice going. Uh, rest assured, it was not as long of a night for us as it was for Brian Ferentz and family. Uh, oh, boy. Not a great rough. football game from the Hawkeyes out there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, don't, I think any way you slice this, John, like this is an absolute beatdown, a throttling, a bludgeoning, um, an ass kicking. I hope we can say that here. If not, I just did. An embarrassment for embarrassment, uh, for, yeah. For a program. I, was, I mean, I, it, it was, was bad. Thirty-one nothing win for Penn State in the whiteout. Uh, this was this was never a game. Um, it was. I don't know. I, I think I went into this. I, I joked on our first episode. Well, technically, this is our first episode. By the way, if you have not already, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, you will find us in all of your audio feeds where you listen to podcasts uh, after this episode. But, you, you know, I, I, I joked that I watch Iowa football because I think it's funny. I think the chase mm-hmm. for Brian Ferentz to get uh, 25 points per game is funny. And then you watch it in person, and then it gets kind of sad. Like, it's it's a little less funny. It's a little more upsetting. I came with some notes today, John. I got, I got a few notes about just how bad this was. Uh, Penn State held Iowa to four first downs, the fewest allowed by the Nittany Lions since giving up just two to Eastern Illinois in 2009. Yikes. That's embarrassing, right? Penn State held Iowa to 56 passing yards. 56 passing yards. Let that resonate. Uh, Penn State held Iowa to 76 yards of offense, the fewest ever allowed by Penn State in a Big Ten game and the least since holding Temple to 74 yards in 2006. Um, This, uh, Iowa, gosh, I was talking to uh, my colleague at The Athletic, Scott Docterman, late last night, and I was like, Scott, like, where the hell do you go from here covering this team? Because it's just been like this for so long, and they've got plenty of of their own issues to get to, um, so we we won't dive into that too much. But one thing I do want to hit on, John, before we really get uh, wrapping and rolling here is, The fact that all week, right, for Penn State, it was, hey, this is another game. This is trying to go 1-0 each week. The cliches, the mantra. Uh, By about 11.30 last night, the cat was let out of the bag. I was talking to Denai Dennis Sutton, and I said something about, like, what do you feel like the ceiling is for this defense this year? Because they have been remarkable. We saw it again last night. Um, And he said, yeah, this was personal. This was a game that he said James Franklin hammered home all week what had happened in uh, 2021 at Kinnick Stadium, of course, the injury fiasco, that players were made aware of it, that they saw clips of what happened in 2021 because Deny Dennis Sutton was a high schooler at this point. Right. Um, However, after the game, P.J. Mustafer was on FaceTime with some of the defensive linemen, right? P.J. Mustafer, of course, was, if there's one player who really should have an axe to grind, it's the former Nittany Lion captain who tore his ACL during that 2021 game and was promptly booed by the Iowa crowd. Uh, so he's, uh, Denai Dennis Sutton said that, yeah, P.J. Mustafer was was happy for them. Uh, talking to Chop Robinson, if you notice, after Chop Robinson's uh, strip sack of Cade McNamara in the third quarter, which effectively ended the game, I mean, at that point, Honestly, I think when the they opening went, kick may have ended the game. Yeah, when right, Iowa goes down really ten nothing, you're one. like, Eef, like, do they have a shot? Uh, but the strip sec after Chop Robinson does that, he flops on the ground twice. And I asked him afterward. I said, "What was that?" Because I knew what it was. Because then I Dennis Sutton told me what it was. Uh, that was an ode to Lavar Woods. I was special teams coordinator who, of course, flopped on the sideline in 2021 about the fake injuries. So Chop Robinson said, "Yeah, like we don't take that disrespect lightly." So. I thought that was a great glimpse inside of what this week was actually like for Penn State because so often we kind of get the cliche robotic answers. And this is everywhere in college football, right? This is everywhere in sports. Oh, it's just we're playing against whoever's lining up against us. Um, but yeah, this was absolutely personal. And so I think as the game wore on, uh, Penn State did not let that fact subside. Yeah, no. And uh it's funny. We saw the ending of the West West Virginia game where they threw the ball because there was zero coverage out there. Uh, we didn't see them really gunning it, but you did see a couple pass attempts on a drive by Bo Perbula, a few pass attempts, I should say. Uh, they they wanted nothing to do with leaving Iowa in this game. 
right? Like they, they had no interest in allowing this to even look close at the end. They're, it seemed like they wanted the embarrassment factor, and uh, they got it. The you know, Iowa I, offense completely the, inept the entire game. And you mentioned those defensive ends. Mm-hmm. Chop specifically was just a game wrecker throughout. Like he is, he was an absolute nightmare for their poor, poor offensive yes. lineman who I kept just feeling bad for throughout the game. Uh, but you're right. This was this was different. It was not just a a one and O mentality this week. At least it didn't seem like it based on what they said. Yeah. By again, by 11:30 last night, the cat was out of the bag, um, which I just found extremely amusing. Got a whole story up on the Athletic about that. Um, but John, I think that's a good starting point for us with this defense because, my God, they're really good. Uh, yes. We've known this the last few weeks, but you keep stacking dominant showings, right? We knew all offseason that these defensive ends were a strength. James Franklin said it. Um, they had three guys who they thought were co-starters. What I really liked what they did last night, this was a new wrinkle they put in. We saw all three defensive ends on the field at the same time on a few third downs. Let Chop Robinson rush from up the middle. And my gosh, he was a menace. Um, he absolutely bull rushed the interior of this Iowa offensive line. And this is a package, because I asked James Franklin about it afterward, they want to keep building off of this. This is now going to give teams something else to prepare for. And just overall, John, what has stood out to you about this defense? Because there's, there's a lot to like. Yeah, I think the question that people would have had coming in was the run defense. Right. Like Mm -hmm. it was it's the point of contention because of the Michigan game last year. Um, I think some people would have seen the start of the Illinois game and maybe they would have been concerned that there was about to be the same thing again. I know Iowa was without their top one, maybe two running backs, depending Mm -hmm. on, you know, how you how you stack up their second and third guys. Uh, And, you know, this wasn't the highest end Iowa rushing attack, but they were stifled like they they never had a chance. Uh, I thought that did a really good job at the second level, which is really important. Uh, in this game, but to me, that that's going to be the defining thing about this uh, this uh, Penn State defense this year. Yep. It's it's how much can the run defense support what is already an elite pass defense. You mentioned the pass rush, the secondary, uh, like those guys are stuck to wide receivers like glue. Like Kalen King mm-hmm. was all over his guys all night long. Johnny Dixon was all over his guys. Take one Hardy, especially against Illinois, and again last night when he played, like he was not relenting in the slot. Uh, that is not going to be an issue. Like I don't think anything in the secondary is going to be an issue. Now it's just a matter of making sure that the front seven doesn't allow runs to get to the third level. doesn't allow, you know, seven, eight yard chunk, chunk rushes. Uh, and I thought last night was a really good example of what it needs to look like for Penn state. The front four, they, the, we talked about it, you know, probably for the last 12 months now, Manny Diaz mentioned it at the Rose bowl with the communication being in the issue, which is really just like our guys, filling their gap responsibility are the linebackers then able to make plays on the ball because they're not like there's not a, a guard flying downhill at them and last night was a really good example of that being the case they, they took care of their responsibilities they played within themselves I thought this was the best game for the linebackers all year I had concerns about them uh, I know Abdul Carter is a great player but he had not been at the highest level going mm-hmm. into last night I thought last night he was he was really really good there was even uh, a screen that I thought he was about to intercept, uh, yeah. you know, the well, one of many because yeah. I will kept throwing them and they were not there. Uh, but but the one in particular uh, that was thrown in his vicinity and it looked like he was trying to find the running back or the tight end that was getting the screen. They just weren't there and the ball kind of got on him quick and he, he didn't make the interception. He tried to make a diving play on it. But I thought they, the, the, the second level of the defense played its best game of the year. And I think that's going to be so crucial for them when they take on Michigan when they take on an Ohio state team that maybe doesn't have the high powered offense that people Mm -hmm. thought they did. I think that could be, that could be the telltale sign for a team that has playoff aspirations this year. John, you just said all of that and you didn't mention someone else who had a big game last night, Uh, linebacker Curtis Jacobs, right? And I think that what we're saying right here, that speaks to how complete this defense is, how deep it is. The fact that Penn state is now a whopping plus 11 in the turnover margin. Uh, Penn State has not turned the ball over this year. Uh, we've continue, continued to see the takeaways. But Curtis Jacobs has that fumble recovery uh, forced by Jalen Reed, if I'm recalling correctly, early on. Well, this was, I'm curious about what you saw in this because mm-hmm. the word, I believe it was officially scored to Jalen Reed. It looked like Deny Dennis Sutton's knee may have hit the ball first and started to dislodge this. So I think it's officially gone down to Reed, but I think it might have actually been Dennis Sutton who forced that first fumble. 
So, so you're telling me you you want to take this up with the stat crew? Is that is that what this is? Because I yeah, I will be firing exactly up the rewatch is. later today, so I will be keeping an eye out for that, John. We'll see if we uh, if there's there a were, correction issued. I rest assured there were about four and a half million replays. None of them were great. And I was at least from the seat that I had in the press box. I kept watching it, and I was like squinting and staring at it. Oh yeah, I, I and, cannot and, see at that distance. Yeah, at all. Yeah, it was even it was not ideal. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. You also look at Curtis Jacobs on special teams, right? Like to me, those were the two momentum shifting plays early in the game. Um, the guys making plays and those were the first two Kern craft 400 moments of the game, right? Uh, this crowd was amped up. We knew they would be whiteouts yeah, are special. The, the shaking press box. It's just never going to be fun for me. It never will. You be. know, what, John, was, I think it, when it first started, to... I was just I hated it. You have to think that like, oh, nothing can go wrong. Like the press box isn't going to crumble, right? That's kind of where I've come to with it because it is. It's an uneasy feeling because this thing yes. starts shifting and swaying. Um, tip of the cap to this crowd. This was an insanely good crowd. Second largest crowd in Beaver Stadium history. And doing this in less than ideal conditions is notable, right? That's what makes this place special. This fan base knows it. They embrace it. They lean into it. You know, I, I felt like, Leading up to the week, John, there was a little bit of concern that perhaps the whiteout, the optics of it wouldn't look that way. Penn State, of course, sends out that tweet on, I believe it was Friday, uh, in which the coaching staff is wearing white ponchos. It was clear to me by the time the team arrived that seeing like splotches of different colors of blue and yellow, different ponchos would not be an issue. And it wasn't. Uh, you saw the way this crowd came for the team arrival. They're all standing up there. Nothing but white. So again, they understood the assignment. I watched people in front of the press box take their camouflage hunting gear, put a poncho on that was white, right? Like everybody understood what they were there, what they were there to do. And the crowd was loud and we saw it bother Iowa right off the bat. That is your home field advantage. That is something to keep in mind moving forward, John, not just this year, but next year when Penn State will have the opportunity, like everyone else, to host a college football playoff game on campus. You have this atmosphere. You have this home field advantage. Continue to lean into it um, because, because it rattled an already terrible Iowa offense. Yeah, and, and it's funny you say that. It, it 100% had an impact, and yet on some level, it, it almost felt like it it had the least that I've seen in a while just because this mm -hmm. Iowa offense was never going anywhere. Uh, it was – listen, I don't, I don't cover Iowa. I'm not around the program on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I don't see things behind the scenes, but I, like I said, I watch them a lot on Saturdays and there, I don't know if I've seen a case of nepotism this clear in a long time. <laughs> like It's just like, well, it, I, well, and I'm sure Penn state fans may be familiar with the term yeah. and what it looks like. Uh, but like this was an offense that wanted nothing to do with the Penn state defense. And you could tell, and guys mentioned this after the game, you know, I, I was asking uh, a bunch of players like, when did they take control, right? Mm -hmm. And offensive players, and you can find, you know, a story about this at centerdaily.com that I wrote last night, but a lot of offensive guys said, well, it's the second, it was the second half when uh, there were adjustments made in the running game to help them control the ball a little bit more, to help them control possession, to help them dominate in the trenches. Guys on defense were kind of like uh, when the game started or on the first drive, like you could see it like, oh, this is our game. That's what tonight Dennis Sutton said. Right. Like he he said that that they felt like they were in control in the first half or in the first uh, on the first drive. And then they realized, oh, the shutout's going to happen or probably going to happen in the second half, like not in the third quarter, like late in the third quarter, not early in the fourth quarter. At the start of the second half at halftime, they realized that they could get the shutout because they were dominating that much. And listen, all the credit in the world to Penn State's defense, because at the end of the day, like Iowa does score points. Not a lot, mm -hmm. but they score points. This uh, is the they... best team in the Big Ten West, right? Which yeah, is like, right. oh, boy. it's it's quite a compliment, kind of, maybe, yeah. sort of. But again, like, this is what we're measuring it up against, right? This was a test. This Iowa secondary against Drew Aller. What were they going to do? And they again, like, this was like, they were so ineffective that Penn State just played that game of complimentary football. And I want to go back to what you said about when they when Penn State felt that they owned the game that they were taking over. Because for me, the only moment that kind of gave me pause came early on to Cade McNamara, the 18-yard run. Yeah, the I mean, scramble he, he, where yeah, Chris Jacobs lost side of the contain field. on that. Yep. The whole side of the field um, is open. And that, to me, was the one moment I was like, oh, maybe Iowa does something. 
But turns out, end of the night, uh, that was Iowa's longest rush. McNamara, God, this stat line is absolutely awful. Uh, he completed five, five of 14 passes for 42 yards with a long of 20. <laughs> and was sacked twice. Uh, he did have four carries, 18 yards. Um, again, this is well, just you mentioned. You mentioned mess. the long of 20, by the way. It was that 20 yard pass was to Eric All. Mm-hmm. He had a 12 yard pass that was a fumble by Eric All. Those were his only two of his five completions that went for more than four yards. I believe the others went for three, three, and four. Like it was, there was no tempting Penn State downfield. They were afraid to do it. They had, they, I, I've, I've mentioned this a lot to people in the last was it, 10 hours. How many people have you been talking to in 10 hours, John? What have you been uh, doing? People in the press box and my wife and my dog gets to listen to me too. Poor uh, dog. But uh, a lot of modern football is mm-hmm. running crossing patterns, getting guys open by giving them runaway routes. And in a lot of third down situations, a lot of key situations, Iowa was pretty stagnant. They would have a tight end run a seam route up the middle, and then they would have stagnant routes around that. So you're really only giving yourself one option because there's only one guy on the move. Um, And and it's just it's bad play calling. It's bad play design. Uh, It was it it was an offense that seemed like it never really had a chance. Uh, You mentioned, you know, the, the stats and everything like you're right that Cade McNamara play it was like okay a linebacker made a mistake in Curtis Jacobs he he lost contain on the edge and McNamara was able to roll out and get this big gain and you kind of had this moment of okay the linebackers have struggled this year so far is this going to be more of that or is there going to be more struggles for this team because this is the first indication that maybe there's some trouble there didn't happen the rest of the game like there was not, like you said, there was not a moment the rest of the game where it felt like to me that Penn State was any sort of trouble. Uh, and like you said, that goes back to the complimentary football aspect of it. Drew Aller, it, it, he was not launching the ball downfield. He was not trying to make I actually, big I got plays. a number for this. I got a, I can't because, again, I came prepared for stats, John. That's don't right. Get, don't get used to this. This may not be an everything week or it might be. <laughs> um, because again, Drew Aller, we haven't seen Penn State push the ball down the field, right? That's been a storyline. That's something we're going to continue to monitor. Um, Per pro football focus, the average depth of target for Drew Aller last night, a whopping 4.4 yards. Low. Uh, that, I mean, low. that is. And usually, and frankly, like that's not, it's not even just low. It's like you, you, you look at that and say, he didn't play well is your first reaction, right? But you have to watch this game and understand what they wanted mm-hmm. to do, what they were trying to do to this Iowa team. And he frankly played to almost perfection. I thought there was one throw. Uh, it looked like they were trying to get a, get a screen uh and it looked like he looped it into like mm-hmm. kind of some open space and you were like okay you can't make that throw against this defense he got lucky it fell incomplete outside of that like i thought he played nearly a perfect game threw the ball away when he needed to throw it away hit some ridiculous tight window throws by the way like people will the say dinkins the, touchdown yeah the dinkins touchdowns incredible because it's on fourth down mm-hmm. to me that that tyler warren touchdown on the leak to the back yes. side of the play, right? Where he rolls to his right. It, it looks easy because Warren is running to open space. Wide open. Aller's yeah. throwing across, across his body and he's throwing over the top of a defender and he just dimed him up to the point that you didn't even realize that the defender, there was a defender between him and Warren. Uh, he just put it in such a perfect spot that it didn't matter. It was one of those throws where like, I, you know, it's not like jaw dropping for, for everyone, but, but I, when I saw it, I was like, man, like that's just... He makes it look so easy, easy on those throws. And you the, the Dinkins throw is like, that's a tight window throw that he just put it in the only spot where Dinkins could get it easily. And the defender had no chance. I thought I, he, uh, he it, it was it was like a, a sort of a, a perfect game to make a baseball reference, a perfect game where like he had like six strikeouts and it wasn't mm-hmm. like this overpowering stuff. But he just went out, did his thing and the other team never had a chance. Is it because you saw my Braves background, John, that that made you said we that... don't we don't need to start arguments this um, early on the podcast. <laughs> but I mean, again, you look at the stat line for Drew Aller, 25 of 37, 166 yards, four touchdowns um, back to that Tyler Warren play the the touchdown. I tweeted out a couple images of it this morning. It's one of those plays where go back, look at what I tweeted out at odd Snyder four. Um, look at the offensive line, right? Caden Wallace has a dude absolutely flattened. Um, Olu fashion is far out of the frame, just standout game from Olu fashion. I think we need to touch yes. on that too, because again, Penn state's offensive line. That's been a theme here over the years. Hell of a game by them. Um, Take a look at the play, and as Warren comes open, I mean, again, you see Theo Johnson in the backside of the end zone. Warren comes across. 
as soon as Haller goes to throw that ball, my initial thought was, oh, he is so wide open that like this, you often your players say, right, this is a tough catch because you are so wide open. Yep. Um, but I think go back, look at the offensive line on that play because it's, it's really remarkable. Now, I wanted to stay on this topic of Drew Aller, Penn State, not pushing the ball down the field. Obviously, it rained last night. It was messy. Does that concern you at all, John, that we haven't seen them push it down the field? Because to me, it's not a worry right now because James Franklin talked about it last night. He said Mike Yurcich was patient, right? Drew Aller was patient. They kept going back to what was working. And to me, that's a really good sign because – Again, we talked a lot already about Aller and his calming presence. We hit on this last week. I'm sure we're going to continue hitting on it because it is just something that's so apparent. But at some point, they're going to have to start testing people down the field. I don't think there's any concern about it, at least not in in my vantage point, because I think Drew Aller's arm is spectacular. He's gifted. The offensive line has shown so far that I think they're going to give him those time for those deep shots. But that's just not what they've been asked to do. Does that worry you at all so far? Uh, no, largely because I think I, mean, I wrote about this in, in my good, bad, ugly column, uh, this morning. I think part of that is I will want you to take those shots. They are begging mm-hmm. you to give their, their, their corners, their safeties, uh, an opportunity to go win at the catch point, to go win the ball when it's in the air. And Penn State's wide receivers are, are good and have been really good. I think this year, last night was a really maybe not clinical, but a really good blocking display by those guys, right? Like they were competitive in that aspect, which really matters against a physical, tough, swarming Iowa defense. But I think those guys are uh, maybe not overmatched, but Iowa's secondary is at very least on their level. And if you stack guys up across the board, Cooper Jean is probably the most talented player Mm -hmm. among Penn State's receivers and and Iowa's secondary. Uh, And you don't want to give him the chance to make a play. You want to take him out of the game. And the best way to do that is – Don't test him downfield. Do everything underneath there. And and James mentioned this in the postgame press conference. They play soft coverage. They're going to play back. They're going to take away everything deep, and they're going to swarm to the ball. They're going to make plays on the ball, whether it's on the ground or in the air. Uh, They're going to run to the ball as soon as it's, it's in the spot where they can go get it. And so you don't give them a chance to get it when it's in the air. And you take away the risk, right? You're, you're mitigating risk essentially. Um, Now, they're going to have to take shots deep. Like yeah, you're not going to beat Ohio happen. State. You're not going to beat Michigan if you can't create explosive plays. They just didn't have to do it last night. Uh, and I think I think that's for good reason. I think that's smart game planning. And you mentioned, uh, you know, what, what James said about like the um, the the patience. play calling everything mm-hmm. and the patience. He mentioned, too, that he did not want Mike Yurcich to get bored with what's successful. Yes, uh, right? I he found that. Yeah, him, yeah, that was yeah, interesting. He wanted him to keep going back to the well, essentially. Like if something was working, mm-hmm. and they kept running that little that little tight end leak route where they would have two receivers, essentially a swing pass, like they would run to a running back, but they'd do it with yep. a tight end from the line of scrimmage where they'd have the receivers blocking. Theo Johnson would catch the ball in the flat and get six yards. Like that's a super efficient play. And because Iowa was playing so far back and because Theo Johnson is enormous and difficult to tackle and can fall forward for an extra two yards, it worked. And I think that like that not getting bored with success is is so crucial for this offense. And last night was a really good display by Yurcich, by Aller, by everyone involved with making that work and getting a team a dominant offensive win. You know, I, I think, too, um, one of the things I was already looking at this morning, the breakdown of the snap count in that receiving core. Um, it's really interesting. We saw Dante Cephas get his first Penn State start uh, last night. Harrison Wallace was available. He played probably not as much as we expected, yeah. right? But he's somebody who it seems like, you know, reading between the lines here, they're trying to ease him back in. James Franklin mentioned last week that he maybe could have gone against Illinois, but essentially made it sound like they were saving him for when they really needed him. Same thing with Amari Evans. Um, it, it was just about all hands on deck with the receiving core, with the lone exception being Malik Mega, which that's more of a special teams thing at this point. Um, but Mega was out for the third consecutive game. And John, to me, uh, looking at it, Keandre Lambert-Smith targeted 11 times, eight catches, 66 yards, has the one touchdown. Um, when Penn State needed Keandre Lambert-Smith, when they needed that number one receiver, to me, he answered the call, and that was on the opening drive of the second half. That drive, to me, spoke volumes, right? Because I think I, I at the halftime, to me, it felt like, you know what? Penn State got the takeaways. They're dominating, right? The number of plays run, time of possession, completely out of balance. But Penn State's only up 10 nothing, 
right? Now, granted, with Iowa, a 10-0 lead might feel like 24-0 to some people, right? But you see that and you say, okay, well, how does Penn State come out to start the half? That was a methodical drive. It was balanced, right? We saw the tight ends get involved. We saw Katron Allen had a few runs. We saw Nick Singleton had a few runs. Aller even had one run. Uh, but to me, that was, you needed Keandre Lambert-Smith, and he had, I believe, three catches on that drive. Uh, and that, to me, is like when it was like, all right, you're starting to salt this game away. And the second half, this offense, again, for the third quarter, because by early fourth quarter, Bo Prabula was in. That third quarter, to me, showed that this is a still a young offense, right? Halftime adjustments. I think sometimes we overblow it and we say that, oh, so much happens at halftime and all these conversations. But James Franklin mentioned it yesterday, and I think there's a lot of truth to it because this is a young team, or at least a young quarterback, still some young running backs, a receiving core that's still trying to prove itself. The halftime adjustments, you then come out, you show it in the third quarter. It reminded me of the 2016 team. We always heard so much about that of, hey, we're going to try to figure it out in the first half, come out in the second half, and then you really kind of hit the gas pedal. And that, to me, is what that third quarter was for the offense. Now, the run game. Um, Katron Allen gets the start last night, which to me, it just seems like they're going to keep rotating who starts because yeah. Nick Singleton, I believe, got the start the week prior. Uh, Katron Allen, 21 carries, 72 yards. Nick Singleton, 17 carries, 49 yards. Um, longest run of the night was Singleton on the 19-yard run. What do we make of the run game? Because this is one of those games where you thought, all right, rainy, wet conditions. I keep, I feel like I keep writing every week that at some point these backs are going to have these explosive rushes, but we haven't seen that yet. Cause for concern or not, John? Yeah, I think, I think I am more concerned about this than anything else within this offense. But at the same time, I am not overly concerned. Uh, I think on a scale of one to ten, how concerned? Ten being most concerned, one least. Where probably, are you? Probably, probably a six. Right. Like, I I think uh, enough that like there are adjustments that need to be made. Maybe there's a change in game planning and not. And I'm sure people will love hearing this. uh, Maybe go away from the run a little bit. Like, don't be so overly dependent on it, because I think Mm -hmm. some of it is predictability. Right. Like, it's not it's not necessarily uh, once you start taking those shots downfield, though, it's going to open up. Right. It opens things up. It's it's not it's not showing your hand of the defense so consistently, Mm -hmm. which I think has happened from time to time. Um but yeah, I think I think the blocking has been good. I think Nick Singleton is not having the year that maybe we had anticipated. Yeah. Not to say he's been bad, but there's just been more uh, hesitation from him. I, I actually think Catron Allen the last couple of games has been pretty good, especially last night. Uh, the yards per carry won't tell the tale of this game. I think I think a lot of it, you know, you'd have to look at the success rate. Essentially, are these guys getting enough yards to make it, to create a first down right in three mm-hmm. downs? And I think uh, a lot of times Catron was getting three, three, four, and then, or like, you know, two yards, four yards. And then on that third and four, he was getting six, seven yards, right? Like when it mattered most, he was getting those yards. He was creating a first down on third downs. Uh, he, he falls forward because he is a hard runner that I would not want to try to tackle. Uh, Devon Elise, you know, <laughs> as you mentioned, has compared it to getting hit by a car which i hope to never experience what it's like hope to get none of you listening Island. however yeah. can can compare that i've yeah <laughs> cannot speak it, to that experience it, but it like it can't be fun for defenders and mm-hmm. iowa you can tell they really by the second half they were just leaning on that defensive line like they just it, it seemed like they took their will to compete because Allen just kept going at those guys over and over and over again and eventually like these guys are human, right? Like they, they just don't want to deal with it anymore. They don't want to get hit by him over and over again. He wears you down. And they that don't to want me, to feel that impact. That is what's so unique and so special for Penn State about this backfield because you have the two different running styles. Uh, I'm with you. It's, I won't say alarming, but to me, it's really interesting or, cur- or curious at this point that we haven't seen the run game hit that level that I think we all expected, right? Because I believe Nick Singleton is one of the best running backs in college football, right? That's not a scorching hot take. That's the reality, right? We all saw that last year. Um, It just hasn't clicked all the way yet. Now we're only four games into this thing. It's a long season. Um, I'm with you. It's about a six scale, right? A six, maybe a seven, um, depending how hard of a grader I'm feeling that day. But I think they get it together because again, the blocking has been there. 
Um, the other thing, Penn State last night, four for four on fourth downs. Uh, you are a Jalen Hurts guy, John Saber. So I, this is why I'm mentioning it. With Saul. The first, the, you the first, the fourth downs rather, fourth and one. Drew Aller, he's what six four, six five, two sixty. I want to say, um, giant. The tush push, right? The famous. Yep. Let's just fall forward. You put Tyler Warren behind him. Um, worked perfectly, right? These are the things you can do with this massive quarterback. Um, but again, to me, that's a, that's another sign of confidence. It's a sign of you know what. Fourth well, there's down, no more sign of good. confidence than doing mm-hmm. it on second down from like yeah. six yards out. Yep. Like I was listen. I have been. I I know some people have been critical of Mike Yosich for this. It was. I loved it. I absolutely love it because there there are times where again, big Eagles fan, not not shy about it. Where I'm like, listen, it's it may be second and four. If you do it twice, you're gonna score. Like and yeah. and I Mike Yurcich said, you know what? Let's try it. And and it didn't work as efficiently as they would have hoped. I think they only got a yard off it. But that kind of confidence in play calling, that kind of confidence in Aller and your offensive line, I think speaks volumes. And the thing too, because that made me, but you just said, made me think of this. Um, one of the things that we've heard from both sides of the ball is that it is fun to play here. Right. And yes. like, you can say, Oh yeah, sure. You should be having fun. It's football, whatever. We saw that with Manny Diaz and this, this new look package with the three defensive ends. We're seeing it with all the wrinkles, right? All the tight ends that they got involved, uh, Khalil Dinkins, right? That's the catch of his career, the touchdown, right? Mm-hmm. Like that is a massive moment in this game also for him as a player, for him and his development. Uh, we saw the receiving core that they continue to cycle through. Again, so much talent on this roster. They're getting guys involved. Uh, the highest snap count played per True Media, because I looked this up this morning, 83 snaps, um, and that was several of the offensive linemen, Olu Fashionu, Drew Aller. But then you start to look as it, as it trickles down. And late in the game, Javen Williams gets in 14 snaps. Anthony Donka gets in 14 snaps. So again, these freshman offensive linemen, two guys that you probably redshirt, uh, they now played in their second game. But again, it, to me, it's like it's been interesting in that this game coming into this year, I don't, I would not have thought this. I don't know if you would have. Probably not, because you're relatively sane. Um, I don't think we would have seen the backups on the field for most, most of the fourth quarter. Right. I would not have projected that. Yeah. Especially like in a situation where you're dealing with a, a very physical Iowa mm-hmm. defensive line, where you're dealing with a unit that is not getting pushed around by anybody. Like there are, there are other strong offensive units. This is Iowa that this Iowa team will face. And I don't think they're going to do to them what this Penn state offensive line did to them last night. Uh, Real quick, I want to go back. You mentioned the, the Dinkins touchdown, and I don't think uh, people are giving enough credit to what Yersic is doing mm-hmm. with the play design, not just the play calling. Uh, I believe they they came out and it looked like it was going to be another touch push because three of the four fourth downs were converted on those sneaks. The yeah. fourth one was the touchdown to Dinkins. They audible out of it, and they just it may seem simple, but they they put Dinkins in the slot. They get, I think it was a linebacker on him or a safety. And he just ran a simple crossing route and there was nothing. There was no other route to that corner of the end zone. There was nothing there. It was essentially, Hey, there's open space. Dinkins is a really good athlete run to it because you're more athletic than the guy covering you. And you're going to have room to make a catch. And you have, I'll say it, an elite quarterback, an elite passer Mm -hmm. making that throw that you have confidence that can get the ball in that spot. Like this is, Yursich has really opened up this this offense, uh, and I I mean I think it's just confidence in Aller. I don't want to you know speak for him. I don't want to put words in his mouth or anything like mm-hmm. that. But it seems like their passing game is much more open this year uh, than it was last year, and it has been the last few years under Yursich. Part of it, 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 you mentioned the offensive line. Part of it is is that, but I think part of it's confidence in Aller. And and the other thing you mentioned, the backups getting in. Those guys now have confidence, right? Because they're getting those extra reps. And so much of of football, and I know I I, I used to not be a believer in this, but so much of football at the college level is just belief, right? The the faith Mm -hmm. that you're doing something right, the the confidence that you're The Ted Lasso-ism, John? Right, right. I hate to go all Ted Lasso on everybody, but the confidence that you can do it really matters in those one-on-one situations because if you don't have confidence, like you're you're, you're just never going to succeed. In those I'm going to get you a believe sign, John. We're going to make that your background. Listen, you I love Ted Lasso. You don't. I will not Same. take shame I, in any of that. I, yeah, uh, I mean, but no, you're right because it's buy-in, right? At the college yes. level, especially, right? You're because we're kids, 18 right? to 22. Not, that's this the motivation. Is, 
As James Franklin has said how many times, 18 to 22 year old males, the most unpredictable group of people on the planet. Um, And that's where you have to have that locker room dynamic, right? That's why I thought it was so interesting that they went the bulletin board material route this week because that's not, that is not, you know, what we've come to see from James Franklin, but this was a different circumstance. Now you can't go to that narrative every week nor will you need to, right? But this was a special circumstance. This mattered a lot to James Franklin, to these coaches. Um, And so you push those buttons, right? That's part of what being a head coach is, is knowing how to motivate your team, when to do it, when to push and kind of pull back. And in that regard, I think they really, you start to see, right, these dynamics at play. Uh, To me, this is a fun group. It's also a confident group. It's also an insanely talented and gifted group. And I think there's a special recipe brewing here, John. It's early. Bigger tests are still to come, of course, with Ohio State and Michigan. But every week they keep answering the bell, right? Every week, Drew Aller has been playing turnover-free football. Complimentary football travels. A suffocating defense travels. A quarterback who's not going to force throws and throw the ball away, that travels. Like, to me... You just see it week in and week out, and you have to be excited about what this young group is putting together. Um, anything else, John, on the offense that that kept well, you I up just, last night? Anything? Well, what kept me up last night was the game existing in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the I think that to to continue with Aller, like it's not it's it's that he's not afraid of the moment, right? Like yeah. he's not at no point do you feel like he's losing himself within a moment, and that's so so crucial for quarterback play and with the bulletin board material like listen they're gonna have it for the other two biggest games this year in ohio state michigan there are going to be people that say that they don't have a chance against ohio state it won't have to be manufactured it won't be like georgia saying nobody believed in us despite georgia (laughs) being the number one or number two team in the country last year that was just complete lunacy yeah yeah i mean whatever people have to manufacture their motivation however they do but like come on what are we doing there uh but the There's going to be people saying that, well, this is Ohio State. Like, Penn State doesn't win this game. They never win this game. Against Mm -hmm. Michigan, they can point to things that people wrote, this guy included, about, like, last year's demolition of Penn State, right? About the embarrassment of of what Penn State did last year when they went to Michigan. They're going to have those things. Are you trying to put yourself on the bulletin board, John? Is that what this is? It wouldn't. wouldn't Do do you think we've ever appeared on the bulletin board in the Lash building? I. I don't know that I if 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 I haven't that Michigan game will be the best chance for me too because I was pretty scathing I think rightfully so. Hey, listen, after, I, after they yeah, lost to after last what year. happened last year, absolutely yeah. warranted. But I, I do think you're right. I do think that is something that they can point to and say, "Oof, yeah, remember how we got demolished on the ground last year?" Well, um, and, and the the the, the, this, the quirks of the schedule this year, uh, and this is one mm-hmm. of the things that I wrote about last night. It, it's really interesting, and it's something that I. I, I, I talk about a lot with people like they had essentially a law on the schedule of relatively easy games and then Iowa. And then they have another law on the schedule where they faced Northwestern UMass and have Northwestern bye week. bye week, right? Northwestern bye week UMass. I think. Yeah. Northwestern bye week UMass and Northwestern might be a bye week, although they beat Minnesota last night. So and who knows? UMA- UMass uh, might be too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so you have these three kind of slow weeks and then Ohio state, and then you have, Indiana and Maryland, two teams that you should handle. Indiana that almost lost to the fighting Joe Moorheads of Akron. Akron. Uh, Four last overtimes, night. I believe. Yeah, just a brutal football game. Dude, I would not recommend rewatching that one to anyone. I just wanted to see the overtimes, and even that was pretty tough uh, on, on, on a watch last night. But they have that law, and then they have Michigan. Like, And then they close it with Michigan State. But like, there, there are these gaps to breathe you know what i mean mm-hmm. for this team there, there are these gaps to like kind of figure some things out like let's say you know they beat ohio state but it's not a perfect game they've got a couple weeks to kind of recalibrate test some things out against listen Indiana it, it, it will not handle. be a perfect no. game it will not be a perfect no. game right yeah. like you're playing an opponent that good you got to take your shots Absolutely. you're gonna have to have some calculated risks absolutely right like this is that's going to be a tough game no doubt about it but back to your point about the kind of the lulls in this schedule. Uh, last night, highest number of snaps played on the defense. Abdul Carter with twenty eight. Again, wow, that is that that's jarring, right? Like this took me back to the snap counts after Delaware, um, when it was you know a lot of guys resting, game gets out of hand. So this should be 
a relatively fresh defense going into Northwestern, right? If Northwestern goes, they were on the field for like six minutes last night, right? Like, oh yeah, the time of possession. Gosh, John, let's. Uh, it let's, was it was very funny. Do we, I really started tracking this in the third quarter. So mm-hmm. the third quarter alone was by my count thirteen minutes and twenty six seconds to a minute thirty four, and I actually made the joke to to Bob Flounders of Penn Live who sits next to me. So Iowa gets the ball back with a minute and one second left. And I said, oh, they're going to finish with X amount of time in the quarter. Five seconds later, Chop had the strip sack. I was like, well, never mind. I guess we'll just tack those 56 seconds back onto Penn State because they it was they had it for five seconds. Like it was yeah. a minute from a minute one to 56 seconds on the clock. Iowa had Penn the football State and they had immediately the ball. coughed it up. For 45 minutes and 27 seconds, Iowa had it for 14.33. The number that we may never, ever see again in our sports writing careers in terms of crazy, absolute bonkers stats, Penn State ran 97 plays to Iowa's 33. Uh, My friend Max Olson, colleague at The Athletic, per True Media, no FBS team in the last five years has been out-snapped by 60-plus snaps until this um, I mean, this you could you could write a whole story off of the quirks and oddities of this stat sheet um, because it was just it was just so crazy. But well, some yeah, of it so, is just like the combination. And I, I know I keep saying this, but like the embarrassing level of where I was offense is right now. But mm-hmm. that's what happens when an embarrassingly bad offense runs into one of the, I don't know, five best defenses in college football. And by the way, like I don't want to we mentioned to, to just go back to it real quick that, mm-hmm. you know, they'll face tougher challenges. That's true. I don't think they'll face a better defense all year. I think this Iowa defense, it's either this Iowa defense or Georgia that's the best defense in the country. Some people will say Michigan, and I understand that. Like I'm not, mm-hmm. it's there's an argument to be made for Michigan as well. But I think this is the best defense that Penn State will face this year. And they it, the circumstances won't be the same. They won't be able to just dominate the Michigan offense like they did the Iowa offense and then put more pressure on the Iowa defense. But this is the best unit they're going to face. And Drew Aller just went out and played mistake-free football, essentially, against the best defense or the second-best defense in the country. Yeah, this was not uh, – if you said, hey, Drew Aller threw four t- touchdowns, I think I would have expected something a little bit different, right? I would have expected more than, like what, 166 touchdowns. yards? Yeah, two um, interceptions, like some just launching of the ball. No, I mean – and I've I've written this before on The Athletic, but to me, again, um, you guys are listening, you know me, followed me on Twitter, whatever – you know, I'm a Packers fan. You can see it behind me if you're watching on YouTube. Um, I compare it to growing up watching Brett Favre, right? You knew there were going to be moments of brilliance. You knew there were going to be throws that he shouldn't make that he did. And then you knew there were going to be those interceptions that you're just like, oh my God, this is part of the experience. To me, that's what it was like watching Sean Clifford, right? Now, I've spent my most of my adult life watching Aaron Rodgers, right? You knew you were going to get the crazy throws, but he was going to throw the ball away. He was so much more calculated. He'd take the criticism sometimes like because he would throw so many passes away because he didn't want to take those risks. To me, that's like what we're watching here. Like in my head, that's how I can compartmentalize this. It's like you go from the, hey, there's going to be brilliance, but you're going to have the turnovers that come with this quarterback because that was just part of the Clifford experience to, hey, this guy looks in control. He looks confident. He looks poised. Uh, he looks poised. Like there's just not kind of that helter skelter feeling that I felt like, you know, we'd see from Sean Clifford a lot. Um, you know, I, I still think the, the scary thing, if you're a Penn state opponent uh, in these next eight or eight plus games, right. We haven't seen the ceiling of this team and that's the scary thing. That's the, you want to be playing your best football by the time I believe October 21st rolls around Ohio state was October 21st. That sounds right. Um, I'm terrible by the, dates, but by I know the time it's that rolls around, um, you want to be playing your best football, right? You want to get it cleaned up then before, uh, before you play Michigan. So to me, it's like you keep building on it, right? It's week by week. Um, Penn state also appears and, you know, we'll we'll see more at practice this week, but it appears like they're really good in terms of health right now, right? We saw the receivers come back. There weren't really any surprises um, on the injury report ahead of the game, so seems like health wise they're they're in a really good space too because that's that's critical. But I I am curious this week, and obviously we're not going to know this until the game on Saturday, but you've got a really good chance to get some of these lower snap counts, right? We've heard about Olu Fashionu and load management. Well, Northwestern 
very much could be a load management game for Penn State, despite the 11 a.m. kick in Central Time, which we know how that very how exciting. that likes to rattle some people. Um, but us. to me, that's it's, it's us. We are the people that that will. Well, be it's us. It's also the coaching staff. But yeah, yes. 11 a.m. for us means we'll be up early. Um, anything else, John, that we have not touched on? Iowa. The highlight of the night was the punting for them. Um, Tory Taylor had yeah. seven punts. Uh, James Franklin did mention that there were a couple times that James Franklin's like, I don't even know how he did this, right? Yeah, uh, like it the crossbody Australian style punt is like really yeah. like it's it it it's uh it seems physically impossible, right? He's essentially running to his right, punting it mm-hmm. back left, and it's also he's launching it and getting a good I mean, roll. John, we're a bunch it's of sports writers. Like, Everything's physically impossible for us. Yeah, right. right. Exactly. But this, this one's physically impossible for most people. Like mm-hmm. this is is some genuinely incredible stuff. It's a shame that we're talking about the punting, which I think is a good uh you know point of uh emphasis of where this Iowa uh program is at right now but no i think like we we hit on the big stuff right this is a this is a playoff contender i think it is it's Mm -hmm. and i I think it's probably unfair to call it a playoff contender i think it's a national title contender at this point i think it's a team that has legitimate chance if it ever and and listen for most teams in college football everything has to break your way i think this is a chance this team has a chance if everything breaks its way to win the national title this year which i know it's four games in i know that the offense has not shown everything but it has the quarterback and it has the defense to make this happen. And I mean, if, if you're a Penn state fan, this has to be a really exciting time because it feels, and because of the, the laws in the schedule, it's like, okay, you get the Iowa game. It's like, now you get three and a half weeks of anticipation, like waiting yes. for Ohio state. Like, what is this going to look like? I think a lot of us will be like, we can do this because we're not coaches who have to focus on things week in and week out we'll be like looking ahead like okay what's this matchup gonna look like you're kind of now keeping an eye on ohio state mm-hmm. i'll be watching their be athletes watching ohio up state, front Notre Dame. that defensive yep. line at ohio state their, that's always... their defense is excellent i think you know and i had been referencing that i thought ohio state penn state would be a higher scoring battle i maybe that mm-hmm. is not as true after you know watching some of last night i'm gonna go back and rewatch ohio state notre dame yeah i week. saw zero I, seconds of ohio state notre dame last night yeah i uh can't help myself. I have to like, I come home and I watch more football. It is a problem. Someone needs to stop me. I'm sure my wife and dog would appreciate it if I did, but I am who I am at the end of the day. Uh, but they, their defense is very obviously talented, mm-hmm. but disciplined And Jim Knowles is an excellent defense coordinator. All of that is a story for another day. That is the kind of stuff that you will be able to find here. Uh, over the next few weeks on the Nittany Dispatch. So we'll be back uh, midweek with our, our Penn State Northwestern. We'll kind of check in, yeah. see what the, the pulse of the team is this week. Um, and then we will both be hitting the road for Evanston. Yep. Um, I will be taking a long and winding route that we can get That's into right. a little bit more uh, at midweek. But I do want to say, John, before we, before we get out of here, um, you mentioned that this being a national championship uh, contending team, you get that sense from the crowd, right? You get yep. the sense that this is a Penn State team, goes up big, fourth quarter, it's raining. These people are having a ball, right? Like it had that You're party atmosphere. Yes, like people stayed until late in the game because to me, it's like they want to be part of something, right? They want to be part of what very well could be a special season and they want to be able to say, hey, you know what? I was there the night that Penn State took it to Iowa, right? Like, to me, you're feeling that from the fan base. Again, you and I, we live here. Uh, we can see the RVs rolling into town on a Wednesday, right? Yep. We can see the grocery stores filling up Thursday and Friday. Uh, people are buying their tailgate supplies. I'm going to get the cold brew at Wegmans because I know the night game is going to take a toll on us. Um, but y- you see these, these instances where people are believing in this team. They're having a lot of fun with this team. Um, and it's it's good to see. It's refreshing to see. Um, that's why you and I are here, right? That's why you and I are here to to document this season, wherever it's going to go. Um, you guys will now be able to find us on YouTube, but we'll also be out on wherever you get your podcasts. You'll be able to find us now. Um, so this is the Nittany Dispatch with Audrey Snyder, John Sauber. We will be back midweek to give you a preview of what probably will be a very one-sided affair in Northwestern. Yes. And don't forget to uh, follow Audrey on Twitter at oddsnyder 4 Follow me at John Sauber. Uh, you can obviously find all of our work. Mm-hmm. Everything we're writing, we will both be tweeting it, sometimes begrudgingly.
Yeah, don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. If you like our show, it helps. Um, if you don't like it, please don't. Don't. <laughs> no. Or just give us uh, our websites anyways. It's either way, nice right? Like, we're here. We want this to be fun. We want to get you guys involved uh, in the show, give you something else to listen to. So we appreciate you giving us a listen. This has been the Nittany Dispatch. We will talk to you again midweek.